Hello, my name is Bob, call sign WO6W. I'm a relatively new and enthusiastic CW operator, and I really enjoy sending with fine instruments, be these modern or vintage. What I'll be sharing today are setup and adjustment for two of my favorite Begali keys, the Intrepid Semi-Automatic and the Sculpture Swing Sideswiper. Both of these keys are relatively unique. The Intrepid is one of the smoothest operating bugs that I've ever encountered. The Sculpture Swing is possibly the most adjustable sideswiper that I've ever used. As I get into these descriptions, please let me make clear I am not an employee of the Begali company. I consider the Begalis to be my friends. I've gotten to know them better over the last year. But again, I'm just sharing my experience as a user of these fine instruments. Thank you. The Begali Sculpture Swing is a sideswiper key, also known as a kuti or a double speed key. The sideswiper, as well as the semi automatic key, the bug, were both introduced in the early 1900s as an answer to telegrapher's glass arm, what we would today call a repetitive stress injury. Both of these keys changed from an up and down motion, as used with a straight key, to a side to side motion which was much easier on the telegrapher's arm and also allowed for greater speed. With the double speed key, moving the paddle to either, either side of center closes contacts. Operation is done with a side-to-side -side motion. In this video, I will be demonstrating setup and adjustment of the Begali Intrepid Bug. As shown with just one of the speed weights, the speed range is approximately 19 to 37 words per minute. Adding the second speed weight, the bug slows down to something on the range of 16 to 29. Throughout the presentation, I'll be referring to the various controls on the bug and parts of the bug. We have the two walls, which carry the various adjustments. This first arm coming from the finger piece extending this far into the bug. I'll refer to as the primary arm. This is the arm that physically moves when you adjust the paddle, uh, when you adjust the finger piece, when you move the finger piece. The secondary arm here toward the back of the bug, further from the user, I'll call the dot rider arm. You can see that the two arms are touching each other here in the middle. When I move the paddle over to make dots, this primary arm pushes on the dot rider arm, putting the dot pendulum into motion and creating dots. Okay. This first control on the right, R1, is used to center the two arms between the bug walls. The second control, R2, is the dash contact. When I send dashes, the dash arm moves into contact with this adjustable contact here. Third control is a dash repelling control. It sets the weight, uh, the amount of force needed to send a dash. So you have a magnet here on the end, which is working in opposition with a magnet uh, on the arm itself. These are pushing each other apart. The fourth control on the right is the dot damper. When I'm sending dots, the dot pendulum is vibrating. This damper absorbs any residual energy when you stop sending dots. This control, number one on the left side, is an adjustable dot contact. You can see a small piston-loaded contact here at the tip of it. This comes into uh, contact with a, a dot contact fixed to the dot pendulum. The second control, left two, is the dot repelling magnet. Again, we have a magnet on the control. There is a magnet in the dot rider arm. These two are in opposition. You adjust this to set the force required to push the paddle over to make dots. This third control is the dot travel stop. As you make dots, the dot rider arm 
is pushed over until it comes into contact with this stop. This sets the amount of travel uh, that is available when you send dots. And then this final control, left number four, is a magnet which attracts the dot pendulum. This control can be used to fine tune the length of your dash, uh, excuse me, the length of your dots relative to the space. It attracts the arm, hangs it over on the contact, just a small amount more or less. Makes for a very nice fine tuning. This illustration shows the various parts of the bug with their names and the nomenclature that I'll be using. I'll hold this on screen for a few seconds more. If you are watching this uh, offline and have the ability just to uh, pause it for a moment, you might choose to grab a screenshot that you can refer to in the remainder of the presentation. We'll begin by centering the primary and dot rider arms between the two walls of the bug. If you look now, you can see that these silver arms are running parallel between the walls of the bug. This control, R1, sets that center rest position. If I bring the control in just a bit, you'll see the arms pushed a bit out of parallel. If I come back out again, they return to that parallel position. This control centers those two arms. One check that you should make at this point is to make sure that the dot rider arm is actually resting on the dot rider arm stop. When I do dashes, I would expect the dot rider arm to stay fixed while the primary dash arm moves away. So watch that the dot rider arm stays where it is. This confirms that the rider arm is actually resting on the rider arm stop. One adjustment that you should never need to touch but might want to confirm is that the piston-loaded dot contact is well-centered on the fixed contact on the dot pendulum. The piston-loaded contact wants to hit you know, roughly in the center of that contact riding on the dot pendulum. Our next adjustment is the amount of travel of the finger piece when making dots. When I push the paddle over to the right, the dot rider arm is going to come to rest against the dot rider arm stop. So I adjust this control to set how much the finger piece moves when I make dots. Um, when I make a sequence of dots, you'll see the rider arm come to rest on the stop. I'm moving the finger piece about a couple of millimeters, and it gives me enough energy to make on the order of 15 or so dots. More than enough for any legitimate Morse character. We're now going to make a coarse adjustment of the dot weight, the relative length of a dot compared to the space between dots. When starting this adjustment, make sure that the dot fine-tuning magnet, control L4, is backed out and that this magnet is not real close to the vibrating pendulum. At the moment, it's uh, just a little bit more than a millimeter of the magnet protruding beyond the wall. I then want to adjust the piston-mounted dot contact so that it barely kisses up against the contact that's on the dot pendulum. So I'm gently going to push over to the right. And that's actually very close. And this gives me a good starting place. Next, we set the force needed to make dots. I have a relatively light fist. I like a fairly light amount of force. And I set the force for my dots at about 15 to 20 grams. Force applied in this way. That force is set with the dot repelling magnet L2. There is a magnet here on the tip, which is working against a magnet in the dot rider arm. Bringing the magnets closer together increases the force. And as I say, this is set on my bug 
for about 15 to 20 grams. We next set the dot damper with control R4. This little white nylon disc at the tip has some motion in it. And as the dot pendulum is released from a string of dots, it will touch this wheel and the wheel absorbs any residual energy in the arm. Uh, you'll notice that right now the wheel is roughly parallel with the ground. The orientation doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And it's set so that the arm just comes to rest. Now let's adjust R2 for the amount of travel as we make dashes. The end of R2 has a contact on it. When the primary arm comes over to the side, those two make contact. The position of that contact further out, further in, controls the amount of movement. As I have it, the tip of the finger piece is moving almost two millimeters. This is just set for something that you will find comfortable. We now set the dash repelling magnet, control R3, for a comfortable amount of force to make dashes. You can see that as the primary arm is pushed over to this wall, this magnet on control R3 is in opposition to a magnet in that arm. Bringing the magnets closer together increases the force. For my hand, I tend to use about 40 grams. And I determined that by setting the control for what felt good and then measuring it. There's no magic number. Uh, you may want to know the number that you use for repeatability, but this is one more control that's set to taste. We now come to the final and arguably the most sensitive adjustment on the Intrepid. This is the weight of the dits, the length of a dit compared to the space between dits. The primary control for this adjustment is the adjustable dot contact L1, bringing this piston mounted contact closer to the contact that's fixed to the dot pendulum. For fine tuning, should you need it, is the uh, dot fine tuning magnet L4. Bringing this magnet closer to the dot pendulum pulls the pendulum over to the side a little bit more, lengthening your dots. Backing the magnet away allows the dots to shorten slightly. So previously, we had set this so that the contacts were just barely kissing with the paddle all the way over to the side. I'm going to back off a little bit. And now I'm going to adjust the dots by ear. To my ear, those are a little bit light. Maybe still a little bit light, shade more. And to my ear, those sound very nice. I'm not going to need to touch the fine tuning magnet. Once you have your dot weight set, there are a number of ways to confirm it should you wish to measure it. Ideal, of course, is if your ear knows the sound of the dots that you want. Failing that, the traditional method has been to stick a moving point or ohm meter across the contacts and adjust it for roughly 50% of full scale. Uh, slightly heavier dots would move toward zero ohms. Slightly lighter dots would move toward infinite ohms. Modern computer programs, you can use PCW fist check to make a nice measure and graphical presentation of the length of your dots. You can also use programs such as Audacity to record your side tone and look at them uh, in that fashion. These are the dits as measured by Audacity recording the side tone on my machine. You can see that the length of the dit is ever so slightly longer than the space between. This is a slightly heavy dit, which to my ear sounds good. The PDF describing this procedure is shipped with the Begali Intrepid uh, from the factory. If you'd like, you can also reach me at wo6w at arrl.net, and I can send you a copy of the current PDF. We will also be posting this video on the Long Island CW Club uh, YouTube channel. 
possibly the greatest strength of the design of the sculpture swing is the range of adjustments that are possible. On many keys that are used as side swipers, the paddle comes to a hard stop when the contacts close. So as you key to the side, the contacts close, and there's no additional movement. It's like hitting a wall. Some of us like a more fluid, softer landing, where as the key hits the contacts, additional motion is possible. With the design of the swing, the amount of that additional movement, the over-travel, is user-adjustable. How hard that additional movement will be felt, uh, the contact spacing, all of these are adjustments that can be made. So that pretty much whatever your style of side swiper sending, the sculpture swing can be adjusted to accommodate it. This can be especially nice if you're new to using a side swiper and don't yet know what style of sending you're going to like or if your style of sending evolves. The sculpture swing will evolve with you. Let's now look at the various controls and their functions. I'm going to begin on the portion of the key that is closest to the user, this portion up here. The primary control for setting the force to deflect the paddle from side to side and the fine tuning. Let's take a closer look. What I'd like to show now is the adjustment of the force needed to move the paddle on the sculpture swing. If you notice, there is this black surface curving along the front of the key here, and that when I move the paddle to either side of center, that black surface, that black cam, pivots about this point. There is a bearing in here, which is fixed to the paddle arm, and that bearing is running in a curved track on the cam. So as I move it either side of center, the bearing runs along that track and forces this cam in closer to the user. Riding on that cam is a fixed magnet. There is a magnet in opposition, which is connected to the end of this control. Movement of the paddle either side of center brings those two magnets closer together. Bringing this control in closer to the body of the key brings the two magnets closer together and increases the amount of force necessary to move the paddle either side of center. Fine tuning of the force to move the paddle to either side is accomplished with these two spring-loaded pistons. I'd suggest backing these off so that they don't contact the arm and making your course force adjustment for side-to-side -side movement. These two pistons can then be brought in until they just kiss up against the arm at rest, and then you can adjust the two to set either a uniform amount of force, left to right, right to left, or to set up a small imbalance at one side or the other if that's your choice. So again, the front magnet is the course adjustment. It is fairly equal in its effect on movement to the left and to the right these two spring-loaded pistons to fine-tune the force left and right. As I move the paddle from side to side before the contacts close, you can see that the only components involved are the cam for the course force and the spring-loaded pistons setting the fine amount of force. Once the contacts close, back here at the rear of the key, you can see this gold contact, which is affixed to this beam, makes contact with the adjustable contacts, adjusting these contacts in and out, sets the amount of travel side to side before the contacts close. There's a second setting involved here. This beam traveling up and down the length of the key is going to flex after the contacts close. So watch the beam here. You can see there's a bit of flex in that beam. The amount of beam that's exposed between the end of the rigid paddle arm and the contacts is going to control how hard or soft the landing will be when the contacts close. If you imagine this contact being moved up very, very close to the fixed part of the arm, you'd only be flexing a very small portion of that arm, and it would be quite a hard stop. If you move this contact way out on the key, 
down toward the back of the key, away from the user, more and more of this beam will be exposed and it will flex more and more easily. So let's adjust the key for a harder landing, a more rigid stop when the contacts close. In order to do that, I'm first going to back off the adjustable contacts. Then I'm going to reach under the key, loosen the screw that holds this black tray, and move it forward. I have to back the contacts off so that they will pass by the uh, gold adjustable contact here in the middle. So let's pause for a second. So I've gone under the key. I've released the lock screw for this black tray, moved the black tray much closer to the front of the key, and the gold contact has been left behind. I can now reach in and just slide this along the arm. No tools required. Place it roughly centered and then adjust for the amount of travel. Way too much for me. Let's close that down. Close this down. And now there's a very hard landing. I can flex it a little bit, but not very much. To revert to a softer landing, I'm basically going to just reverse the process. I'll back out the adjustable contacts so that the gold contact can slide freely between. I'm going to reach under the key, release the tray, slide it all the way back down to the other end, snug it up a little bit, slide the gold contact back along the beam until it's centered between the two adjustable contacts, and bring those in so that the spacing is comfortable to my style of sending. And you can see now there's much more flex in the arm, much softer landing. I'll pause, return the key to my normal operating. So I'd like to mention two more adjustments, which are frequently overlooked when speaking about the setup and operation of a side swiper. The first of those two adjustments is the spacing between my fingers. As my sending on the side swiper picks up in speed, I tend to bring my fingers closer together. I don't have so far to travel to get to the paddle. The second adjustment is the centering of the paddle between my fingers. If I'm off to the side, it becomes very challenging to send uniform dits as I go from left to right to left to right. I really want the paddle closer to center. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope some of the information presented here will be useful. There is a PDF file which describes the controls and setup procedure for the swing. That file is shipped with the swing from the factory. If you email me at wo6w at arrl.net, I can send you a copy of that current PDF file. This video will also be made available after this expo on the Long Island CW Club YouTube channel. Again, thank you for your attention.